ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಆ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ದಿನ ನಾವು ಒಬ್ಬ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದಂತ ವ್ಯಕ್ತಿಯವರೊಂದಿಗೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಇಂಟರ್ವ್ಯೂಗೆ ಬರ್ತಿದೀವಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಹಿ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಐ ಶಾಲ್ ಡೂ ದ ಇಂಟರ್ವ್ಯೂ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಪ್ರವೀರ್ ಪುರ್ಕೆಸ್ತಜಿ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ನೋನ್ ಟು ಮೆನಿ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಅಕ್ರಾಸ್ ದ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ಬೋತ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮೀಡಿಯಾ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಜರ್ನಲಿಸಮ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಜನರಲ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ and uh, as a news maker for once uh, uh, he is also becoming a news maker in a different sense uh, from last year when uh, he was arrested and uh, then of course recently he's been released and the court has termed this as illegal not any of us activists or filmmakers saying this but the court itself has said it and today we are here with uh, uh, pravir to understand who he is and uh, and uh, his journey so far and also as people in the media or otherwise just to know uh, what it means to be a journalist in in today's times uh, welcome to this uh, talk uh, pravir and uh, we are doing this for idina as you know idina is a news portal from bangalore and please briefly uh, describe your, your journey uh, as a student activist from being a student activist to a journalist it's almost getting into prehistory i'm pretty old as you know i'm as old as the country's independence so that is that will take a little longer than what we time we have so i'll be very brief about it i was an engineering i was in engineering college and a student activist so these are the two parts of my life the political part as well as the engineering part which most people don't know about and uh, most people do not recognize that i i was a practicing engineer for about 40 years of my active life so that's one part which is how it led into journalism as well because when i was looking at the scenario in the 2000 odd years i was thinking that lot of our young friends as well as our older friends thought that facebook and youtube is enough you don't need anything more and they were really missing out that journalism was going to change with technology and having the salience of technology that's where i come from even in my politics i've been a science activist i've been a free software movement activist i will say i've been an activist on the issue of the global commons given all of this background i said okay since i know computers i was one of the early people in computers in engineering when we didn't even have a computer science as a course in engineering colleges so i started my professional life also in ntpc and in other organizations looking at computer controls okay, which was where i was really that was my core area of work now i thought okay, because of this i should be able to help the journalist community or those who wanted to get into different forms of media how this could be done cheaply could be done easily and in that sense we could really scale down not have expensive equipment but still make an effective presence so i started news click more as an example or an exercise on showing how it could be done and unfortunately most of my friends still continued in believing that facebook and youtube are the only platforms we don't need to do any of this and today of course they themselves recognize that that is that was something which wasn't really appropriate but unfortunately for me that led to news click being becoming a more active portal becoming the place where a lot of people wanted to go to and my i did my basic uh, focus was also even at that time was to cover movements of different kinds the dalit movement the movement for land movement for wages and i was very i was very irritated when i read read mainstream media which would look at a working class struggle if workers marched on the roads they would look at it from the point of view of the motorists those who were in the cars 
how difficult it was because it created traffic jams, not why the people were there on the streets for. And this is how the mainstream media generally tended to portray, or what I would call the big media, tended to portray the, ma the struggle of the people. So News Click focus was really on the struggle of the people. And that is where my two interests of being a social activist and being a technology person combined. And that's what led to the development of News Click and, of course, all that you have in front of you. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. And from an engineer to a journalist, you have told me about your brief journey and you told me the motivation for setting up News Click. Um, now tell me, uh, how do you view the current avatar of the mainstream media, particularly in the last decade? And what are the challenges uh, for the real journals, so to speak? I mean, there is a need to describe them the real and unreal in this current world, unfortunately. But I should do it first. You know, if we look at what I would call the big media, now, why I'm calling it the big media is because it's run by big business houses. And big business houses, as one of the owners of one of the major media houses said, that we are not in the business of news, we are in the business of advertisement. And that's a factual statement. Let's not think that he was being hypocritical or he was making a statement which was intended to shock. The fact is that all media today, globally, in, the, in India, really runs on advertisements. And that's why the big media, of course, caters to those who advertise. So that's why I think Sainath once said that there is only one journalist to cover farmers, but there are 40 journalists in Bombay at the time who would cover fashion. Now, I think the ratio is even more skewed today. So given that kind of reality, the point is, what do we do? Now, this is not an Indian challenge. This is a global challenge that does media, which is not dependent on advertisement, have a business model. A lot of people believe that YouTube and uh, Facebook would provide the revenue model for them. Yes, it does and no, it doesn't. It provides a revenue model for maybe a handful of journalists, and that also not a significant amount. But yes, maybe enough to run their you know daily costs. But it certainly does not allow them to set up anything except becoming influencers, as the current terminology is. You cannot have an in infrastructure built on this which allows you to do it at scale. So as individuals, yes, but scaling of that model is a difficult. So that problem still remains. And the problem for that is not how you and I can do things about it, but how does the state as an institution, the legal system that we have built as an institution, allow for a certain amount of what would be called public funding for public media, just as we also have to think about how public funding of elections should take place and that the election should not be influenced by money, which it is done, it, it is to be, it's happening in almost all, big, all countries. So when we talk about democracy and elections, we have to bear in mind elections are expensive and therefore the nexus between money and politics is very much there in the elections as well. So I think we are seeing a similar situation for media as well. And the solution does not lie in you and my doing something about it. It's a collective responsibility of society. How does it make in media more in the interest of the people and not in the interest of the cat? Well, um... People like us, for some reason, are also called independent journalists. And uh, probably I was asking, the, I suppose, the opposite of an independent journalist, a dependent journalist and a dependent media house. And therefore, we are seeing what we are seeing. Uh, but uh, 
tell me why is it that the current regime is targeting uh, journalists like you it's very clear it's also targeting activists uh, the academics even lawyers uh, lawyer activists particularly why is this kind of uh, targeting you know it's an interesting question media or independent voices have always been targeted by the ruling establishment the question is one of degree and it is the when the qualitative change happens when the degree is such that it is no longer the normal that you expected and i will take two examples of this to illustrate this because uh, i was i faced both these establishments during emergency we had the new norm new normal was if you said anything you were out your uh, paper was legally bound to accept censorship as you know the first day of emergency meant the electricity to all the printing presses of the newspapers were cut off so no papers came out on the emergency day the following days already then the censorship had been put in place and therefore papers started censoring their news and as protest some of them left blank columns still they were told even that was not enough. okay so that was the new norm that you had to listen to what the government told you because there was a state of emergency now that didn't last for more than a year mrs gandhi did a uh, little more than a year 19 months is officially the date actually it was 17 months because two months the elections had been announced so virtually uh, you could speak what you want so given that situation oh, i'm sorry it was actually 21 months and 19 months you could you know you had the really the state of emergency in full motion so given that scenario you've come to a scenario where you are officially not being censored officially so it is really two sets of things in motion one is that you depend on advertisements for the government particularly the regional papers are very heavily dependent on the government for advertisement so that is one lever that the government can wield and the other case is central government and central government is supported by big business who also are the big advertisers as well as the fear because they are also in other businesses this is not the only business for them so the business houses have multiple interests and as we have seen some of the raids takes place it's not just the ed and the income tax department which are very much in news these days but there are other instruments against individuals as well i'm not going to we know the uapa is one such instrument but also the pmla is being used quite widely in fact much more than even uapa and therefore we have a scenario where people are afraid to speak so this your question was why does it happen now why it happens is a, is a, a answer really not for me but for political analysts of a different kind but to be to be short on this the issue is when people think that they represent not the government but the state that they are the state they are india and that means they embody not simply a political party which is in power but they represent really the much larger entity called india then we have a problem and i think this kind of transformation on one hand individual politics politics of the individual becoming the state but also the politics that whatever i say must be right and anything which is opposed to what i'm saying is not simply criticism but goes beyond that far more and would could be interpreted as something not against the government but against the state so the distinction of what is against the state what is a legitimate criticism of the government and what could be considered to be alienation from the state which then under law could be interpreted to be various other things that that distinction starts wearing off and i think that's what we saw formally under emergency today we see informally under what we could call an undeclared emergency but i wouldn't call it that i think it's really 
trying to change society in a different direction, in a different way, trying to uh, have an agenda which post-independence could not be implemented by the right-wing forces, which they are trying to implement today. Given the fact that we have a crisis of governance you know, in the last few years because before 2014 elections, that you could think of that Congress party, which was in power, did not have its, it did not have a definition of what its agenda really was. Post-independence, there is a clear agenda of the Congress. That agenda starts getting hazy in the 80s and 90s. And I think that's where the vacuum led to an emergence of what we now have as, the, as a political force in government. Uh, that's interesting again and brings me to my next question and uh, which uh, many of us are noticing. Uh, do you think the right-wing politics has reached its saturation point? Uh, because I'm asking this in the light of the current of kilt and unhinged rhetoric that is coming from the regime. And uh, they seem to have forgotten their own manifesto. And there is nothing about their 10 years achievement. Uh, rather. Uh, hideous and ludicrous statements being issued uh, from the top most functionary. Uh, do you really think they have reached a saturation point at this time? Well, since we are only a few days away from the election results, I would be very wary of predicting elections. Election predictions generally tend to be, you know, could be faulty because everybody predicts what he really wants to see. So that's that's where I'm being a little wary about my own reading of the elections. And honestly speaking, in the last seven months, I have not been touched with the people. I have been in Rohini Jail, which is 2,200 people, a small, uh, small section of society. And I wouldn't call them common people either. Okay. So you have a few political activists. We had Kashmiri activists who are civil rights activists. Kuram Parvez, Irfan Mehraz, who is a journalist. And you also have a lot of other people, some surely innocent, but some also not innocent. Uh, and of course, therefore, my reading of the larger scenario outside would be very, very flawed. What I do see is that this election also is not being fought by parties. There is a ruling party which has resources, clearly, which has also a lot of support because the way they have built up their movement, their campaigns, there is some support for that, trying to say India should go in a much more majoritarian direction. That's one part. The second part is the weakening of the political parties because of the various actions taken against them. You have seen in Maharashtra, for, in, for instance, breaking of political parties and the use of ED and PMLA cases against a lot of political figures. So given all of this, how do we read the election is one that it seems that opposition parties are not really the ones fighting the elections, but a lot of people who are unhappy with what has happened have come out and are fighting it, precisely because of the lack of resources for the political parties today in the opposition. So I think that opposition versus the ruling party gap in terms of resources is quite significant. We have the election bond figures as well. So given that, it is the people. And you know, this is something that I saw during the emergency, as post-emergency as well that it was not the opposition parties who fought the elections, but the people. So will we see something similar? Well, we, have, we are only a few days away, so I'm not going to make predictions. But I do believe that this election will see the emergence of a more significant opposition in the parliament, if not, if it doesn't see the BJP being reduced to a minority, supported by maybe other parties to be in the, in the government. But nevertheless, it could lose a certain number of seats. Whether it will lose more significantly is something that I would not be the best, uh, as I said, the best poll predictor, if anybody is. 
because as I said, I have been out of touch. I have been only in Delhi. I've come out after seven months, 15, 10 days or 12 days. So I would not call myself in any sense a political analyst who has pulse of the people, if there is any such animal. Understood. Uh, but you've been an activist for years now, uh, barring the seven, seven or seven months or a few days. Uh, do you see a significant change in the way that civil society is approaching electoral process? Because frankly, I do. I think this is not the civil society that we had seen in quite a long time. Uh, civil society is taking very active part. Civil society is very, very voiceful today. And we saw this in Karnataka. I've been part of a movement called Edelu Karnataka or Wake Up Karnataka. And elsewhere, there are similar movements. And the civil society is taking a very active part in telling the Election Commission of India a whole lot of things. There are a lot of letters that are going even as we speak. Uh, do you see a very different civil society today? And what does it mean for the politics as well in India? Well, I would again hesitate on this count because I do feel that different parts of the country are reacting differently to a different set of issues as well. So I think the fact that India has always been, in some sense, a mosaic of different identities in the country and holding such a country together is not an easy task. In fact, that was the main task after independence. How do you hold it in spite of partition that took place, the riots that took place, the linguistic identities of the people, one could call ethnic identities, but I don't want to do that. But certainly linguistic identities, religious identities, other identities, caste identities, all of these was the melting pot, shall we say, of Indian nationals. So these issues are again coming to the fore, as you can see, because once there is a crisis, all the crises, that, all the contradictions that exist in society also come to the fore. I think what we are seeing is a crisis, not simply of a certain kind of politics, but also a certain kind of economics. And that economics did not start with the BJP, it started really with the Congress. Manmohan Singh was the architect of that. So given all of this, I think you are seeing a political and an economic content, you know, crisis that is emerging in the country. What is the path of future development that we should take? And in this, of course, the crisis manifests itself as a crisis. All the crises come together manifest itself into all these contradictions sharply. I think that's what we tend to see today. And in this, clearly, the, there is a section, say, take the farmers in, U, in Western UP and Punjab, Haryana. Their reaction is not the same as farmers, say, in Karnataka or in Bengal, because the kind of crisis of agriculture they are facing is different from the crisis of agriculture that is being faced in other places. So I think we are seeing all, all these contradictions coming together. So when you say civil society, I would say we have to add all of these contradictions to say what is emerging. And can all these voices that you were saying are emerging, and I completely agree with that, can all of them form a coherent alternative to what the current direction of governance is. And I think that's where the problem is going to lie, that while some are very clear that this is not the path, but on what path that should be followed, we are going to see differences emerge as well. And I think that's good because it is contradictions that lead to development, development of people, development of ideologies, development of movements, everything. So I think that is to the good, and I agree with you that we see many more actors today on the, on the field, on the question of politics, on the question of elections, than you would have seen, say, five years. And I think that is the significant change. But it's interesting. It is manifesting itself, I think, in very different, different ways in different parts of the country. I will say Karnataka and 
Haryana, if you take these two as the antipodes, they're very different ways they're reacting. They're reacting in Haryana. In fact, the farmers have said that we don't want you to come into our villages. Punjab farmers have said that. So you have that pictures on the in the newspapers as well. And this is mainstream media. It's not news click reporting. It. So you have these pictures on one hand, but you also have in Karnataka what is happening. And this is not the contradiction in Karnataka. The other contradictions which have come out. I think that is the that's an interesting part of what we see. But you know the interest the, what what is really different about Indian politics is that how all of this comes together. Unlike what you see in so-called land of democracy, UK, US, and you know European Union, various countries. I think we are reaching ten thirty. So I think we should really perhaps wind this up now. Thank you so much, Praveer, uh, for being with us. We might, again, knock on your doors once again. And thank you so much. And uh, just like you, we also hope that uh, the current developments lead to a new set of politics in India, and uh, which is more based on constitutionalism uh, rather than uh, interest, uh, business or otherwise, uh, community-based or otherwise, but in the interest of India and the idea of India. Uh, so let's hope for the best and uh, we wish you the best and very happy to see you outside and uh, you're looking cheerful. Thank you, ever. Ashok. Thank, Thank you, Ashok, and for having me and for this discussion. Thank you so much. A very good day to you. Thank you. Matashto Vishesha video Galanu Nodalu, Matu Hosa video Galabage Tirialu, Edina.com YouTube channel subscribe Madi, Matu bell icon click Madi.